Hey everybody, welcome to Composers in Quarantine Drinking Cocktails. I'm here today with Brian Kroc for a very first edition of Composers in Quarantine. So Brian, yeah, welcome and thanks for being our our very our very first uh, guest on this program. My pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. And um, cheers, by the way, speaking cheers. of cocktails. Um, very nice to see you. Yeah, likewise. Feels like a deja vu all over again somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Brian, I, I wanted to have you on the on the podcast because um, I first heard your music on your release, Big Heart Machine, your self-titled release, Big Heart Machine. And I was honestly just blown away by how unique um, the music is, both in terms of composition and in terms of orchestration. Um, and as a composer, I, I felt myself kind of chuckling at the first track on your record, um, Don't Analyze, because of course, the only thing that that made me want to do was analyze um, <laughs> yeah. that, that composition. <clears throat> but for those of you who don't know Brian <clears throat> uh, and his uh, accolades, as, as maybe uh, you've heard his music played by the New York Youth Symphony Orchestra as he was a uh, commission winner of the first music commission. He's worked with the Metropole Orchestra, writing for Layla Hathaway, working with Vince Mendoza. Uh, he won a the Manhattan Prize for a string quartet composition um, for his string quartet number one, which uh, was that your your first string quartet piece or was that um, <laughs> yes. a yeah. cheek title like not dissimilar to uh, Don't Analyze? No, that was absolutely, it was my first and so far only string quartet. I mean, I've written for strings uh, on numerous occasions, but that was a, uh, I was attempting to do, it's a four movement, 20 minute long string quartet. So um, wow. I was sort of attempting to like deal with the genre at its level, if you know what I mean. Um, and I haven't had right. the courage to do it again because it's a very challenging thing so right so. wow 10, a 20 minute piece that's pretty remarkable yeah i mean i don't know it's uh it, i mean this would be an interesting thing for us to talk about actually is is how you de decide upon and develop a form for a piece of music because um i don't think that writing a long piece is necessarily any harder than writing a short piece other than it's going to take longer to write but um but if, if a piece is, is meant to be, say, three minutes long, finding the maturity to, to be concise and to edit yourself um, is just as challenging as, um, as, say, writing what I did, a five move, the five movement um, Tamil Pice um, suite on the Big Heart Machine record. You know, that ended up being like 45 minutes of music. Um, one isn't isn't more hard than the other is what I'm saying. It's just that they're they're different sort of containers, you know. And in the the challenge is deciding what's right for the music. Right, that's kind of an interesting point, um, actually, that you've just made. Is that it's it's not necessarily harder to write a three minute piece of music um, versus a forty five minute piece of music or a twenty minute piece of music for that matter, right? The challenge almost becomes like staying honest to the to the music itself and, and allowing the music to inspire mm -hmm. um, continuously throughout the composition, um, the rest of the music. Um, that's really yeah. interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. On, on the same, sorry to, to, to cut you off, on the same note, I would also say, because I say this often to students and peers and colleagues and stuff, I don't think it's more challenging to write music for um, a force of 40 instruments than it is to write for one instrument, you know? They're, they're, they both have their challenges, you know? So writing a solo violin piece or writing a solo piano piece to me would be a huge challenge, just as challenging as writing for a big band or for an orchestra, just different challenges. Right, so let's dive in here. So when you sit down to, to write, um, you're, you know, whether it's gonna be for a solo violin or whether it's gonna be for a 40 person orchestra, or just a just or just a big band. Um, what is your first step step that, that that you go through? Is there do you have a method to the madness? Is is there a method behind the big heart machine madness? 
Sure. Well, um, I think that the creative process for me always changes. Um, so I don't really have a tried and true method um, for writing, say, a Big Heart Machine piece. Um, there's usually um, a period where I just do a lot of pre-composition, which is, which just means that I'm either sitting with a guitar or sitting at the piano or, um, or just brainstorming and, and typing into my um, notes app on my iPhone, um, where I'm just sort of gathering as many different um, ideas and influences and pitch collections and rhythmic cells as I can. Um, and so one thing that I always sort of advocate is, um, is in the beginning stages of writing, not to get too bogged down thinking about the final product. Um, so something I tell a lot of students and that I do myself is I just start f trying to fill up pages of manuscript paper. Or if you're on Sibelius, just try and start letting it flow. Um, or if you're on Logic or whatever, just start recording, press record, you know? Don't, don't fuss about it too much because once you've collected, um, be it five pages of notes or 20 minutes of audio, then the composition part of the task begins because you it becomes a process of choosing the strongest material. So if I have five pages of, um, of just sketches, I'll go through it every day and then I'll, I'll inevitably, I guess, I'll start coming back to the same things, the same ideas continue to speak to me. Or I, I notice, I start to see that they have a lot of possibilities that I haven't explored yet. So then maybe I'll pick one little chunk of music and then I'll um, fill up another five pages of notes just um, playing around like with commentary. that. commentary. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so really, I think, I guess the, the first step is just sort of um, exploration. So, exploration. So when you're in your pre-composition process, you're at, if, tell me if I understand this correctly, you're not necessarily saying, okay, this is pre-composition for a big band piece. This is pre-composition for an orchestral piece. This is pre-composition for solo violin. It's just pre-composition. You're basically just stream of conscience, letting your, your, your ideas flow and, and just writing them down and just getting connected, your, what you're hearing in your head and just filling it out on the page. And you can decide later what to sure. do with that information. Is that correct? Exactly. That correct? Yeah, and I like to keep a lot of lists. So one day maybe I'll, I, you know, I think it's important if you really wanna um, get good at writing music, just as if you wanna get good at anything, is to try to be consistent with your practice of it, to try to do it on a daily basis if you can. And so, yeah, you know, I'll, I'm, I'll set aside time to just freely sit at the piano. And maybe I come, the idea I come up with one day, I might write myself a note and say, this could be something cool for little, you know? And then I'll just put it away. And then um, inevitably when a deadline arrives and I'm like, oh, I need a piece, uh, by Friday, I can go back mm -hmm. through my lists and be like, oh, there was that idea. That idea is cool. Let's see where that leads, you know? Right. Yeah, totally. That's very cool to hear that you write that way. And I, and I think something that you said really spoke to me. One question that a lot of students or people in general ask me is, okay, how do you get better at writing? How do you, what is your first, first step? And it's almost as though, you know, people are looking for not necessarily a shortcut but just a way to like get started right like we all know that the first step is the hardest step in any journey right but mm -hmm. but even though there's no shortcut the answer is very simple and it's just get started as you said so so perfectly you know just hit record and um mm -hmm. uh, from from our previous conversations i also know that that your composition don't analyze is actually as i've been even though i've been joking it's it's a, a note to other composers not to analyze your, your stuff. 
it's really a note to yourself. <laughs> can, can, can you can you speak a little bit more about that about that piece and yeah, sure. The Big Heart Machine yeah, debut album. Exactly. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, don't analyze the title is actually more of a mantra for myself. Um, I I'm a huge fan of this document that's called um, Rules for Students and Teachers, um, and it's a it's. I actually often liken it to, um, if you remember the, the napkin that Thelonious Monk wrote, um, wrote advice to one of his, like somebody came up to Monk at a, at a concert. Right. And uh, that's an amazing, and said, like, yeah. hey, do you have any advice for a budding? That's an amazing student? document. Like, hey, do so this is a similar yeah. thing. It's like a, right. it's like a document of advice, um, for a budding composer. And one of the pieces of advice is don't, create and analyze at the same time. I think that while you're creating, you gotta turn that analytic brain off or it's gonna trip you up and make you start to second guess your ideas. And, um, and that it doesn't, it's not conducive to creativity. All right, so, so tell us a little bit about like how you, you first started playing music, what got you into writing and how those early experiences shaped or contributed to uh, the musician you are today? Sure, well, um, you know, I, um, first of all, I, I definitely respect musicians who choose to pick one path, like just be a composer, just be a conductor, just be an instrumentalist. Um, I sort of always fantasize about doing that myself because I sometimes feel a little regret knowing that if I were able to put more time into just one thing, I would probably be so much better at it than I am. You know, like if all I did was compose, I'd probably be a much better composer at this point. Um, but unfortunately, I think that the reason, like you said, that um, that I do so many different things is, um, is purely uh, just to make a living, basically. You know, I think every musician especially if you live in a place like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or Nashville, you have to have a multitude of skill sets. You can't, it's, it would be very unusual and lucky to make your living just doing one thing. And so that means sometimes you have to make sacrifices. I think what I would like to do is spend all my time composing, but, um, but I can't. <laughs> so, um, so, but anyways, to get back to your question, I found out that I had a sort of an aptitude for composing, I think when I was in middle school, because I was a huge metal head. I had like hair down to here. I loved Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and I played guitar. I was obsessed with metal. And um, a bunch of my friends and I would get together um, in one of our basements and just jam. And I remember the first thing I wrote when I brought it to my friends, I was so nervous. I was like, guys, I had this idea. Could we try to play it? You know, and it was just a stupid riff. Um, but we loved playing it. And I thought, oh, I could keep doing this. And so I kept writing more for my rock band as I got through high school. And then in high school, um, I was lucky to be, like you said, in the suburbs of Chicago, where there was just such a large amount of talent um, in the jazz world. There, were just, there was just so much great jazz um, being made by my high school peers. And so I started to um, explore that more seriously. And um, I guess I could mention some names. I would hate to make any of them feel uncomfortable, but for example, um, Adam Larson was somebody who I um, heard play when, you know, when we were both 14 or so, and I was just like, wow, that guy's amazing. Um, and there were a lot of people like that in my area. So, um, so I got the chance to play in lots of big bands with talented jazz musicians, and I wrote my first big band piece for some mutual friends of ours, the Fathom Brothers. Um, they had a big band when we were, who knows, 15 or 16. And I wrote an arrangement of Embraceable You, I remember. I still have a recording of that, but I don't think it'll ever see the light of day. 
Well, maybe as a little Easter egg, we can find a way to to release even <laughs> just a segment of that. I don't, you know, maybe, do, did you know Michael, Adam, and I were roommates in college? No, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah. I love yeah. the Fathoms. So do you know Levi Silua as well? I do. I, 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 I don't. I'm just thinking about co co-writers for the Fathom Brothers Jazz Orchestra. Right, right. Yeah. Um, that was a workshop for a lot of us to start experimenting with writing. And then I also want to mention another name. I don't know if you would know him, but um, when I got to college, I went to the University of Illinois. And um, my close friend, who eventually became my roommate, was a guy named Scott Ninmer. Of course. And I mean, I don't know Scott personally, but yeah. He's amazing. He's a, absolutely a genius. And right now he's the um, he's um, a staff arranger for the Army Blues Band, I believe. Um, so he, he um, is arranging music for the Army professionally. Um, and anyways, he and I lived together. And so he showed me basically, he like looked at some of my big band charts and told me what I was doing wrong. And um, not I that really there is a wrong, that. right? Let's let's just say that, right? There's no wrong when you do something. There's maybe more efficient, potentially more effective ways. If you want a certain sure, sound and you're getting a sound. different sound, maybe then you can say, okay, you're doing that wrong. But there's no right, right or wrong in, in music. So. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that there are just maybe um, choices that come choices. from experience and choices that come from like naivete or like not knowing any better, you know? Mm -hmm. and, sure. Um, so, I mean, Scott was a freak. Like he, I remember um, he bought a book of Maria Schneider scores for one of her early records, um, Allegress, I think. And he copied every single measure of all those charts into Sibelius just so that he could get inside them more. You know, he would do things like that. And, and so he, he had a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of knowledge to share with me. So I just wanted to mention him because I learned a lot from him. You know, it's interesting that Scott was, was literally copying Maria Schneider's scores because I, I, I think now, is, is this true that you are a copyist, one of Maria Schneider's copyists? Yeah, yeah, that is, that is, I didn't uh, put that together, but yeah, I've actually been doing a lot of copy work for Maria. Do you find that in copying for her that you somehow just, the Maria Schneider just seeps into you <laughs> and you, and, and um, how, how is that process? Is it inspiring for you? Is it, a, is it, of course, I would never, you know, is it just another copyist job? You know, what is your approach to that? I mean, one of the things that we spoke about today as well is just the fact that people do a lot of things in this day and age because we all want to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. There are very few people who are able to potentially just be a conductor, just be a composer, just be an arranger, just be an orchestrator. For that matter, just be a copyist. So, you know, all of these things, obviously, as a, as a composer, in, in, in terms of of side jobs, side hustles, right? Copying, uh, engraving from Maria Schneider is not such a bad, bad side hustle. No, it's it's absolutely it's tremendously lucky. I, um, I definitely constantly pinch myself because I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure how I found myself in this situation. Um, and uh, and of course, yeah, I learned so much every time. I I I think one of the luckiest things about working with Maria is that. She's very much an analog person. So when she wants something done, she gives you a phone call um, and she writes by hand. So she doesn't even know how to use Finale or Sibelius. So, um, so she's really hearing in her head everything that she writes. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, the, I was just thinking about this the other day because I made a, a pretty grave mistake on one of her. Did you mean to say that you made a pretty engraved mistake? <laughs> I, I did cheers. not mean to say cheers. that. No, cheers to that one though. That's, yeah, I made a pretty bad um, error on one of her charts and she sight read the chart in the context of a concert and the mistake was obvious and I was, 
um, horrified. So anyways, to make me feel better, she told me a story about a mistake that she made when she was doing copy work for Gil Evans. And that just like, it still hasn't fully sunk in like, you know, the direct lineage that's there, you know? And it's such, it's such a lucky situation for us and for everybody who gets a chance to work with these people that, you know, you can think about the fact that Gil Evans, Bob Brookmeyer, these people were working directly with McNeely, with Darcy James Argue, with Maria, and those are the, those are the um, gold standard practitioners of what we do. And we get to actually go to their concerts, say hello to them in, in person. And I'm, I'm really trying not to take that for granted, especially, you know, as during this pandemic, there, we're losing so many of our um, heroes and our colleagues. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I think it's just so important to be conscious of the fact how lucky we are to have these people around, you know? Right, yeah, jazz is one of those art forms in which the compound nature of the lineage is just really so present, um, given that the art form itself is so young, right? Like, we're not so far removed from the original practitioners of the big band writing idiom. You mm -hmm. know, Johnny Mandel uh, is still alive today in, in California, you know? Um, of course, Jim McNeely, Bob Brookmeyer, <clears throat> those guys being in New York, you know, together at the same time, and Jim being one of our teachers, you know, is is something that would be so easy to take for granted. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that story that you just told about Maria um, making a mistake in one of Gil's charts is is very crazy. And it, 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 you know, now now you are a part of that mistake lineage. <laughs> one day it also just one day, says so much about who she is as a person because yeah. Yeah. she could have been like you're fired that was an embarrassment and instead she was like trying to make me feel better you know right so there's that empathy and that's one thing that really comes through in her writing too you know is mm -hmm. in my opinion at least is is that empathy um mm -hmm. that that humanness mm -hmm. that patience you know mm -hmm. um very cool so you know during quarantine, you know, we're, we're all, I, you know, I think we're all thinking about our mentors and, you know, taking the time to write and just be as creative as we possibly can be. Um, so what is, uh, what is something that you have been up to in this quarantine that has been keeping you motivated? Um, and yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, um, that's a, been a tough thing, I think, for everyone has been staying motivated throughout this quarantine um, when there's so much anxiety and fear uh, about the unknowns of the future. And I think that um, while I hope that we are out gigging again very soon, I don't wanna plan on it. And so I, after, you know, I gave myself a period of a few weeks to feel sad and to feel sorry for myself for all the gigs I had canceled and now I'm, um, I've sort of jumped into action. And um, to be honest, I've been like inspired by you. I've been inspired by um, people like Nick Finzer, um, people like Adam Neely, who went to MSM with Miho and I. And um, you know, I I realized that I'm pretty far behind in terms of engaging with social media and connecting with fans that way. And so now I'm starting to really um, make an effort in earnest. And the, so the first project that I'm doing is a, a weekly analysis, ultra nerdy, like ultra detail oriented score analysis right. um, YouTube channel called Score Study. So I'm having so much fun with it because it turns out I really love video editing. And I, <laughs> I got Final Cut Pro like maybe um, uh, four weeks ago or something. 
and it's so challenging, but, um, but it's not very dissimilar to composing and, um, and to working with like a digital audio workstation like Logic or Ableton. So I'm really enjoying doing that, but also I think it's gonna be a great way for me to connect with um, fans of my music and to share what I love about music. So, um, so like you mentioned earlier, I did a video last week about uh, saxophone soli um, by Billy Strayhorn. Um, and uh, this week I'm about to finish a video about um, a piano etude by Georgi Ligeti. And then the week after that, I'm gonna talk about an arrangement I did of that piano etude for Big Heart Machine. So, um, and then I'm just gonna keep doing them every week. So I've got plans to do one about Carla Bley. Um, I'm gonna do one about my favorite orchestration books. I'm gonna do one about something by Darcy. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it, that's a big project. Um, yeah, and for everybody who's watching or listening right now, that very first video um, not only features a great analysis of the eight measure, a saxophone solely in Billy Strayhorn's arrangement for, for Rosemary Clooney on Sophisticated Lady, but it also features a five uh, person saxophone section comprised of Brian Kroc, Brian Kroc, Brian Kroc, Brian Kroc, and Brian Kroc. Um, <laughs> So for everybody who's, who's watching at home or, or listening to this podcast uh, on their, you know, however people are consuming podcasts these days in quarantine, uh, I highly recommend that you go check out um, that, that score study video. So Brian, uh, just to kind of wrap things up here before we take a quick look at Mighty Purdy, what is uh, your advice? If you had to give one piece of advice to younger composers who are just starting out, um, or potentially composers who have been working for a while who just need a little bit of a kick of inspiration. What is what is um, one tidbit of advice that you could offer? Okay, so my advice would be to never lose sight of the jazz tradition. And what I mean when I say the jazz tradition is I mean um, forging a unique path. And so um, be yourself. Don't, um, you know, actually a long time ago, I saw Steve Coleman give a master class and he said, if you're gonna choose the path of uh, individuality, it's gonna be a longer and it's gonna be a more challenging path, but it's more rewarding. And I, I, I um, am seeing that bear out to be true in my own life. And, um, and I hope that um, everybody else will try to keep that in mind. Not to try to be anybody but yourself. Um, don't be discouraged, and um, and don't don't look for um, don't look for uh, um, what's the word um, kudos or whatever. Just you know, just you know, try to be yourself. It's it's a lot more challenging than it sounds when you say it like that. But right. Yeah, it's the easiest thing to lose sight of, but I really love how you said, never forget the, or I forget exactly how you put it, but don't lose sight of the jazz tradition, the jazz lineage. Um, and I think that's actually a, per, a, a perfect, a pretty perfect segue into talking about Mighty Purdy, as you so, so uh, nicely put it, this is not ye old big band chart, right? This is a, um, a derangement um, and maybe, maybe you can, uh, dive in here and, and jump in and give us a little bit of background on what inspired you to write Mighty Purdy and where people can hear this recording. Sure. So um, Mighty Purdy, I'm actually kind of um, divulging a secret on your podcast because you heard it I, here first, never told, <laughs> yeah, because I've actually never told anybody. Every time we played at a concert, I tell the audience, this is a derangement of a jazz standard please come up to me afterwards if you know what it is. And so far only one person um, has successfully, not even people in the band were able to tell. And I feel like I put so many little clues in the score. So the first of which, by the way, I, I went and I found my original score um, because I wanted to look at my notes. And that's um, not anybody's copy. 
that's my copy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the first clue is the title. Mighty Purdy is a reference to the lyrics of um, Take the A Train. Um, the, there's a... Wow. There's, there's a line in there. The lyrics are pretty terrible. Their "Take the A Train" wasn't. Uh, uh, it's not meant uh, to be. A, it wasn't meant to be a song. Right. It's one of those songs that somebody added lyrics later, and um, and they're pretty bad. Um, but anyways, um, it 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 goes. You'll see that old New York is mighty purdy, um, and I just thought that was so stupid, so I named my song after it. Um, no one tell Bob Russell. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, so it's a derangement of Take the A-Train. It's the last track of Big Heart Machine's um, eponymous debut album. And um, when I say a derangement, I'm stealing a term from Jim McNeely. And I think he was stealing it from Bob Brookmeyer because there's actually a sort of long storied tradition that um, goes all the way back to um, the beginning of jazz big bands, which was sort of deconstructing material and recombining it freely. Um, so some pieces that come to mind are, um, um, well, one of my favorite big band charts of all time, which is Four in One. By, oh, um, John, John Hollenbeck. Man, yeah. that was one of the pieces that, that got me into big band writing. I heard that and I was like, mm -hmm. what is going on here? What mm -hmm. is happening? And that's what inspired me to just be like, okay, like let's dig a little bit deeper here. Like, let's see, like how, how can you arrange this jigsaw puzzle and get just a million different sounds out of the ensemble? Very cool um, to know that that also inspired you. You're right, it's a brilliant example of a derangement, obviously yeah. of uh, four in one. Yeah, and Brookmeyer has done a bunch of charts like that. Um, McNeely has as well. On his um, Nanette record, um, which is called Group Therapy, yeah, he hilarious. does the derangement of the fruit by um, Bud Powell. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Yep. Um, so anyways, basically what this concept is, is you're, you're taking apart all the cogs and... Um, when you say cogs, what do you mean? All the uh, you're you're taking apart all the constituent elements of a piece and recombining them um, so that they're almost unrecognizable, and um, this is sort of like a uh, exercise just to get you um, working in a different way and thinking about your materials in a different way. Um, so all of the pitches, intervals, rhythms, everything in Mighty Purdy comes directly from just the the um, 32 bars of take, excuse me, of take the A train. <laughs> so <laughs> it's that cocktail, you know? Is that, um, it's that three o'clock cocktail. <laughs> it's that three o'clock jump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, so that's the concept behind Mighty Purdy. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, I haven't actually, done a derangement of another um song since then but awesome so is there um a certain section eight sixteen measures that you would want to talk about uh sure to yeah give, to give um, people like a little bit of an idea of uh, the the deeper uh, a deeper understanding of of how you deranged um that billy strayhorn duke ellington classic. sure you know what i've got my piano here so i'll try to and it's in okay so the just the first um, the intro to the piece mm -hmm. is the most, I think, direct clue. And it sounds like um, it also spans the whole range of the big band. So mm -hmm. it's yep. pretty, uh, pretty d difficult to perform, but um, it's not, it goes... <laughs> okay, and then you just hold out this, this long D for a while. And these intervals are the same intervals as Take the A Train. Take the A train goes up a major six, down a major six, up a perfect fourth, major third, and then down a minor six. And so this just does all those intervals, but only vertically, only going up. So major six, major six, perfect fourth, major third, 
and then down minor six. So. That's Amazing. just the first. Yeah, and. Um, Very and creative. Then the piece, uh, thanks. <laughs> so, um, and then I guess another clue would be the hand claps. Um, because the 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 whole chart sort of culminates in a chorus that goes um, that thing. Um, the band claps along with it, and they and they if this is the tempo, um, one, two, one, two, three, four. They just clap that over and over. So if, if you turn that rhythm around, um, in retrograde, right? not in retrograde, just an eighth note displaced. So um, it's the rhythm of the bridge. Da -da, da -da, da -da. that thing mm -hmm. it's just an eighth note earlier um, but it's the same rhythm and uh, and yeah I, I, I thought I was being pretty um, obvious with my references but I've been surprised that nobody's um, noticed yet so <laughs> well I'll be I'll be the first to admit that when I listened to um to your record um, I was so focused on not analyzing Thanks, Brian. And thanks so much for joining us today for our first ever edition of Composers in Quarantine Drinking Cocktails. This has been hugely inspiring to me as an artist and as a composer as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And everybody, you can find Brian online. Just follow the links below in the description of the video for his website, social media, where you can find uh, that Billy Strayhorn uh, saxophone soli score study. And with that, cheers. And uh, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Of course, Brian. Of course, Brian. Yeah, it's hopefully see you soon. Always great to see you. Yeah, yeah likewise, yeah. man. Cool. Cool. Bye.